uh, to come to this main symposium slash conference. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, these two gentlemen I've met kind of on the road <laughs> in one way or the other uh, in developing black male studies. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, there has been growing conversations around the need to study black men as particular subjects of not only racial discrimination and oppression, but also sexual violence. Uh, I think the work that's been going on uh, around archives, as well as the contemporary situation that we see with police brutality and the rise of mass incarceration, uh, make this a timely conversation. Uh, that being said, these two gentlemen uh, represent some of the most cutting edge work uh, from different perspectives around this growing field of black male studies. Uh, Dr. Calvin Warren is an assistant professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at Emory University. His first book, uh, entitled Ontological Terror, Blackness, Neolism, and Emancipation is forthcoming from Duke University Press. He's currently working on a second book, uh, tentatively entitled Onticide, Essays on Black Neolism and Sexuality, which argues for a rethinking of sexuality without the human, sexual, different, or coherent bodies. But please do not get him confused with Sylvia Winter. Uh, he doesn't like that very much. <laughs> uh, the second speaker we have today is Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. He is an associate professor of Africana Studies at California State University in Fresno. Uh, his book is entitled, You Must Learn, A Primer for the Study of Hip Hop, and examines the social political histories that contribute to the development of hip hop culture and creates new theoretical frameworks for understanding its development. He's also working on a book on black men, looking at the institutionalization of anti-black misandry. And for those who are unfamiliar with that term, anti-black misandry or racist misandry is the idea that black men suffer not only from racism, but from a kind of gendered sexism or misandric aggressions uh, throughout history. So we will start off with Dr. Warren uh, giving his presentation first, uh, and we will have about 30 to 45 minutes for each presentation, and after the presentation, still we'll have uh, hopefully a lot of Q&A. So, Dr. Warren. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Curry for his generous invitation. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Christine Hughes uh, for uh, the travel arrangements. Um, and thank all of you for attending. I know that you could be other places, so I appreciate your presence here. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is um, I'm just going to introduce uh, what I'll call a blush of a thought. Um, and it is an undeveloped idea, so I would appreciate all of your uh, comments and your suggestions um, because every idea needs input in order for it to cultivate. Um, so my original title is There is No Sexual Relationship. Uh, there is no relationship, sexual or otherwise. Um, I would have renamed um, or revised the title um, to say Anto Castration. Anto Castration. Um, so, what I will be unpacking today, at least briefly, is uh, a philosophical concept, Anto Castration. Uh, black men present a problem space or a conundrum within philosophy and critical discourses. And uh, this conundrum, we will call it this existence without being existence without being. What does it mean to exist without being? We might also reframe this philosophical problem as the distance between the black penis and the phallus. The distance between the black penis and the phallus. So we can um, think about the distance between existence and being as the, the distance between the black penis and the phallus. Every lynching, every rape, every suicide, incarceration, overdose, leads us back to this abyss, this gap within the order of being. Alain Badeau centers the distance between existence and being as the problematic of post-continental philosophy. In his attempt to think being as pure eminence by returning to mathematical form, he urges us to rethink the collapse of being and existence. Thus, to think being, one is always thinking nothing. But this nothing poses a problem for knowledge 
since we cannot know nothing fully, um, and since we cannot know nothing fully, ironically, we begin our philosophical enterprises according to him from within this unknowability, and ironically, we found philosophical knowledge from it. So this is just to say that the deep problem in continental philosophy today, according to Alain Badeau, is that within the order of knowledge, if philosophy is a philosophical practice, that it must begin with nothing, and we cannot know nothing. How do you know nothing? All you can do is speculate about it. Um, but the crisis of post-continental and post-Heideggerian philosophy um, is experiencing something that has revived the field is, in my opinion, a very old and crusted problem. One that I argue black men within the within anti-black orders have been bringing to the fore with seismic force. So my argument is that the contemporary problem of nothing and knowledge and epistemology within post-continental philosophy is something that black men, through their experience, have been bringing to the fore for quite some time now. Uh, what I want then to present here is a noetic experience, experiment or a blush of a thought. The enterprise is difficult since black men pose, pro pose problems for presentation itself, philosophical or otherwise. How do you represent that which is outside of the phallus? With what philosophical instruments can we adequate, adequately capture no thing outside the precincts of being, sexuation, sexual difference, and gender differentiation? The phallus here is the proper name for being itself. Rather than simply a delineation of sexual difference, the phallus is the signifier which grounds being, and we often render being intelligible through gender and sexuality. What I'm arguing here is that um, humans often get an understanding of their being, what Heidegger might call uh, our facticity through our gender, through our sexual orientation. We use these discourses in order to get a better sense of our being within the world or our thrownness. In other words, gender, sexuality, and sexual difference are alibis for being, since they are characteristics of those who have being and not just existence, like a pencil, a chair, a bottle of water is thought to have existence but no being. The phallus then protects the human from the terror of pure existence without ground, without meaning, without significance, without relation. What makes our investigation today difficult is that, as I argue, the black penis is outside the phallus, outside the relation of being and sexual difference. What renders black men a problem for philosophy and critical discourses is that they inhabit a distance outside of being. Well, what is the space, this distance within which black men inhabit? Philosophy has yet to provide a cartography or a location of the coordinates outside meaning and sense. In other words, we can call this inhabitation nothing, the same nothing that poses a problem for post-continental philosophy and knowledge. The question then, what is a black man, or more accurately, what is a black penis, is... Um, perhaps an unanswerable question within the logics and frameworks of philosophy and theory. But we proceed, despite the impossibility, to at least present the problem as one unique to those who possess a penis, the organ of terrifying nothingness. And we can call this problematic ontocastration. Um, Franz Fanon opens up his renowned chapter, The Experience of the Black, which is famously or infamously mistranslated as the fact of blackness uh, within this problem space. And he says here, um, quote, I came into the world imbued with the will to find meaning in things, my spirit filled with the desire to attain to the source of the world. And then I found that I was an object in the midst of other objects. Sealed into that crushing objecthood, I turned beseechingly to others. Their attention was a liberation, running over my body, suddenly abraded into non-being. On that day, completely dislocated, unable to be abroad with the other, the white man who unmercifully imprisoned me, I took myself far off from my own presence, far indeed, and made myself an object. What else could it be for me but an amputation, an excision, a hemorrhage, 
that splattered my whole body with black blood. All I wanted was to be a man among other men. Fanon discloses uh, that to endure anti-blackness, he had to take himself outside the world, outside of his own presence, and make himself an object. I would suggest that Fanon was always already an object, that becoming is a process of human autogenesis, or a relation with being, and the black never becomes, but appears as an object. Put differently, blacks are born as objects within an anti-black world, despite the cry of humanism. Fanon must accept this terror despite his desire to, quote, be a man like other men. The object, however, is not a man, and it is not situated within the network of patriarchy that defines and codifies the man that Fanon wants to be. So what Fanon is is not what he would want to be. But we have a philosophy for what he is not. We call this humanism. Perhaps we call this patriarchy. Perhaps we call this metaphysics. But we have no philosophical covering or tradition to define what he is not. What is he born into if he is not a man like another, if he makes himself an object? What is then this object? We can say that the black penis is Fanon's object. He recognizes that he is nothing more than a black penis in an anti-black world. And this penis lacks presence, the presence which is the masculine prerogative of the man in philosophical traditions, and more starkly, he is outside of the world itself. Unlike Heidegger, who would insist that non-human beings are world poor, um, or outside the world, Fanon insists that for the black, this type of poverty is a racial privilege, which the black penis lacks. Fanon insists, <clears throat> or placed outside presence, the time of man, the world itself, he is cast into objecthood <clears throat> outside, um, outside of time. Given this distance from the world, time, and presence, Fanon averts famously, <clears throat> excuse me, Ontology, once it is finally admitted as leaving existence by the wayside, does not permit us to understand the being of the black man. The field of being, then, cannot accommodate the black penis. Let me say that again. The field of being, then, cannot accommodate the black penis. Placed outside the world, placed outside the time of man, and placed outside presence. Fanon presents the unbridgeable gap between existence and ontology, being either as presence or becoming or certainty. All of these things reach their impasse with the black penis, and they are unable to explain the black penis. They are unable to explain an entity that is existence without being. A, a black male studies, then, is a particularly important um, field. And it must take up this difficult task of providing a philosophical explanation or an episteme for frames of references for this object. We might also inquire about this quote unquote amputation. Fanon describes when he says that he wanted to be a man like other men. And when he realized that he was just an object, he experienced it as an amputation or an excision. So one would then ask, well, what was amputated? What was excised? Fanon indicates that he came into the world imbued with the will to find meaning in things and to attain to the source of the world. But instead, he found that he was an object in the midst of other, other objects. <laughs> this amputation, I would argue then, is the inability to find meaning in the source of the world. The meaning slash source of the world is nothing other than the phallus, the grounding that gives us our sense and meaning for the world. Moreover, he realizes that this phallus is anti-black as it organizes the world through the disposability of blackness, what he calls the metaphysical holocaust. In relation to the phallus, Fanon is a nonsense sign, one cast outside of meaning, outside of gender, outside of sexuation, outside of sexual difference. In other words, Calvin, what does all of this mean? He is saying that the penis is meaningless. The black penis lacks meaning. 
It is an organ of nothingness in patriarchy. We think that the black meaning, the black penis, is full of meaning within our fantasies and our myths. But for Fernand, he says that the black penis has nothing to say, uh, that ontology has nothing to say of the black penis because it is nothing. Um, the black penis, <clears throat> I would even argue, is not even a penis since uh, man collapses the penis with the phallus, and this is what we call patriarchy, to consolidate power. Um, what patriarchy does and why it's so vicious is that it uses the phallus, which is the organization and network of power, and it collapses it with a physical organ. And because men are thought to have the penis, they are thought to have the phallus. Well, feminist philosophers have been urging us rightly to understand that the penis is not the phallus, but patriarchy does that violence by collapsing the two. But now what we have is a black penis without a phallus. Um, feminist philosophy is unable to provide any epistemological reference for what this might mean in patriarchy, and that is why a black male studies is so important to understanding this particular form of castration. Anto castration. Thus, what is amputated or excised is this very phallus, an amputation that has always already occurred as soon as the black man is born. So the onto castration that I am um, presenting here is a feature of black male birth. It is not something that happens as a phenomenological experience. It is a feature of an ontological condition. This condition of the always already amputated is existence without being or onto castration, as I've said. Since the literal black penis cannot provide being or any relation that matters, Fanon speaks of himself as an I, but this I lacks the constituent characteristics of any I that philosophy recognizes. An I, what is an I without being? without presence, without time, without the world. How can this I predicate anything? The amputated I is the void of phallic relation, and it is the condition of black male suffering in an anti-black world. Uh, what I'm saying here is that throughout this um, philosophical meditation, Fanon is describing this auto-castration through uh, the I, through the first person. But any I is supposed to be grounded in a being. Any I is supposed to have the ability to predicate. But Fanon is presenting an I that neither is grounded in being nor has the ability to predicate. And this peculiar I is attached to a black penis. So what is this marvel of a thing? Um, we find this, uh, a, a contemporary reappearance of this problem, at least in my mind, um, the Amputated Eye um, with Eric Gardner. Um, so here we see uh, the phrase, I can't breathe. The phrase became an articulation of discontent and protest following the murder of Eric Gardner, whose last words are recorded to be these, as a police officer choked him to death, snuff film. Right? We all get to see the black man as a star of a snuff porno. But this phrase carry with it, carries within its structure, to me, a philosophical tension, I would argue, and it serves as a philosophical articulation of existence without being. In a sense, the sentence brings together incompatible syntax, which throws the idea of an active subject and its predicating capacities into fundamental crisis. The I in the grammatical sentence is incapable of fulfilling its basic capacities of predication, to breathe. In The Forgetting of Air and Martin Heidegger, Lucy Arigure presents the formulation, the philosophical formulation, to breathe also means to be. And she also suggests to breathe, therefore I am. Since being must rely on air to commence its relation to the human, without breathing the passage of air, becoming as a human ontological trait is terminated, and so is the ontological relation. Without breathing, without the passage of air, um, being is no more. Following this, we can suggest that not to breathe also means not to be, to be excluded from beings unfolding and from relation. 
How then do you understand this I who cannot breathe, this I which is not, neither being nor man? What is the status of an I that undermines the very I it deploys in the utterance? But one might offer the rejoinder that one must be able to breathe to enunciate anything. But here we might suggest that breathing also <coughs> registers ontologically. Physical respiration does not exhaust the field of breath. Physical uh, respiration does not exhaust the field of breath. Ontological breath, the air or the flow of being, is the access to the phallus, the regenerating nourishment it provides for sustenance. What Eric Gardner's video exposes is a scene of auto-castration with different facets of suffocation. This is to suggest that he could not breathe before the physical strangulation. He could not breathe before he was strangulated. That is, within the order of being, he was nothing more than a penis, an organ without breath without access to phallic plentitude, relation, or meaning within an anti-black world. It is because he was nothing more than a penis, though, that police targeted him unjustly. The ontological suffocation that he experienced as a condition of his birth resulted in his physical strangulation that is circulated for all of us to see. And I think that that is an important feature of, of black male studies is that the ontological suffocation that he experiences as a feature of his ontological abjection makes him the target for what we see on the screen. Eric Gardner was the object through which police officers, those who could breathe, reconstituted their relation to the phallus. By murdering Gardner, the police officers were able to finally collapse their penis with the phallus and it is a terroristic triumph. So what we see happening for me in this scene is not only that Eric Gardner is targeted because he is unable to breathe ontologically given that he is nothing more than an organ, but that in order for the male to reconstitute themselves in patriarchy, they do it over the castration of these bodies. Um, so police officers are able to breathe um, over the death of this body. So part of the fascination with the, the black penis then is its multifaceted use as the ultimate equipmental form. Not only is it the source of orgasmic pleasure, purient fantasy, unbounded sadism, but it is an ontological tool. It is what the human uses to reconstitute and refashion the self. It is so multi, because it is so multifaceted, it is an organ of nothing. Its function is to mark the unmarkable. In this sense, it, as it is a sign of nonsense and it's full of contradiction and paradox. It is a something that must represent nothing. The black penis is a something physically that must register as nothing ontologically. And this is why the penis, the black penis, is such a fetish and unrelenting object within cultural imagination and fantasy. And it's something that we will never be able to rid ourselves of. The nothing that terrorizes the human, either if we take it through the Lacanian lens of the real or Badeau's unbearable event, this nothing is the target of unending discipline and destruction. And in an anti-black world, it is the black male penis that has had to bear the weight of this nothingness for uh, anti-blackness. The black penis and the black womb then constitute two axes of ontological degradation along a grid of anti-black valuation. But the black penis as the organ condens condensing a host of philosophical problems is often neglected in metaphysical investigation. As a distinguished philosopher, Tommy Curry has suggested, Quote, the erasure of the black male from philosophical and conceptual study is not the result of the failure to attend to, but rather a deliberate attention to the need to displace slash eliminate the reality of black men's deaths and the violence against black boys and our children to enforce the division between disciplinary knowledge and the problem uh, people observed as objects of study, end quote. 
I would also add to this um, quote that this failure is also a methodological one to the extent that we are unable to supplement the phenomenology of experience with an auto-metaphysical investigation. In other words, since the experience of black men as embodied death is considered normative and of little value philosophically within disciplines, we leave the auto-metaphysical complications of black men unattended because they are nothing more than an array of a dejected experiences. And what I mean by that is that we do not see the image in the, uh, that I've placed here as a philosophical image because we just see it as a normative experience, phenomenologically, of what black men experience as death. But if we were to take black men as having to offer something important ontologically, we would reread this image as not just a phenomenological experience, but as an ontological allegory, or as an ontological scene in which the human is able to reconstitute themselves through structures of violence and their engagement with the phallus. So what I appreciate about a black male studies is that it would allow us to do this. Um, Curry also powerfully articulates in his analysis of black male rape um, that rape becomes not just a phenomenological experience but also an ontological structure of non-relation and not just an activity. What I read when I read uh, Curry is that rape then becomes not just a dejected experience that men also have experienced but it also becomes a way of understanding the uh, vicious ways that ontology is able to constitute itself. So for example, when he talks about uh, how women violate black men, um, we get a sense in which the lack that is often attributed to women is also power. Um, that what we find when women have violated black men through the archive is that if woman is lack, as philosophy and psychoanalysis has taught us, that that lack also translates into social power. That what we find often at the scene of black death is the overlapping of feminine lack and phallic plentitude over the object that has been expulsed from the phallic relation. Now, what, I, what do I mean by this? I mean that the phallic relation is maybe a dialectic of feminine lack, and we can all argue that that feminine lack is problematic and it is patriarchal. But let's say nonetheless that philosophy pro, uh, posits uh, the feminine as lacking and the masculine as being full. Um, the black penis, I argue, is outside that dialectic and requires a third position. Um, neither psychoanalysis existent or sec existential philosophy has a theory of what this third position outside the masculine or the feminine position might be. Which is why um, when I see a scene like this, um, which is um, a lynching uh, in Fort Lauderdale in 1934, um, when I see a scene like this, it gives my eye pause. Um, it's not only that we see a vicious scene of black male physical castration, but we also see a triadic structure. Um, we see that there is feminine lack to the extent that the female is not able to participate physically in the literal castration of the male. That is the male job, the male prerogative. We might say that when the male hangs the black male from the tree and cuts off the physical penis, that it is a way in which the male is able to consolidate his penis with the phallus. The woman may not be able to do that, but she can bear witness, and she can receive pleasure from scopophilia, from the consumption of looking. So what we see in the, uh, the photo here is that um, the place of the feminine, which we might say is embodied within um, the, the figure here, and the place of phallic plentitude, which is embodied with the male and his hat and his arms folded, 
overlap and um, they close the circuit. Uh, what is outside of the phallic relation, what brings the phallic relation together is a third object. And this is the nothingness of ontology, which is, we might say, uh, symbolically presented here as the lynched, castrated man with his hands cupped, um, lifeless, unable to breathe, unable to mean anything. Um, so what I'm saying here, at least trying to work out, is that the black penis must be targeted incessantly and ritualistically to provide support for the phallic relation. It provides support for feminine lack, and it also provides support for masculine plentitude. Um, it is this object that is necessary for the phallic relation to exist. And without the circulation of this object, I would argue that the phallic relation crumbles. And this is why Fanon says he tried to find meaning in the world, but he found that he was cast outside of meaning because the object in circulation does not have any meaning. Its meaning is whatever is imposed upon it within the circuit of exchange. In and of itself, it is nothing. It is malleable or fungible. Um, Lewis Gordon um, presents a formulation of this um, in his Sartrean um, analysis of black men and effeminacy. And he argues that the black male is a whole with a penis. The black male is a whole with a penis. Now, what does this mean? He wants to argue that ontologically, that blackness is um, considered an abyss, is considered a whole. It's always considered lacking. Um, so if the black male, because the phallic uh, privilege is skin color, and in an anti-black world, it is white, if the black male is black, he is already a whole. So what then do we say of this penis? Well, we say that the black male becomes this paradoxical, nonsensical figuration of an ontological whole with a penis. Um, but what we see here is that this is a structural impossibility, that a whole cannot anchor a structure. It cannot anchor a penis. Anything that would come into the whole would just fall through it. So what do we make of the structural impossibility, a hole with a penis? What attaches the penis to the hole? Um, these are philosophical questions that seem nonsensical, but that is because we can only approach the black penis through nonsense. We must rely on nonsensical structurations like a hole with a penis in order to understand what is placed outside the circuit of meaning. Um, and all of this is just to say <clears throat> that, in closing, um, what I think is important about studying black men is not just to give <clears throat> intellectual space to their phenomenological experiences. But it is also to say that black men have something terrifying for, to tell us about ontology. Black men have something terrifying to tell us about metaphysics. Black men have to tell us that nothing in the world is often imposed onto bodies. And that the problem or the paradox of nothing is worked out on black bodies. So to be anti-black is to be, to be anti-nothing. <coughs> Um, when we see the castration, um, the violence, the lynching, the violation of the black male body, what we are really seeing is an ontological confrontation with nothing and our inability to finally eradicate it. Um, we will never eradicate nothing. We will never eradicate the terror, the real that erupts ontology. And for this reason, the black male is necessary. The black male will continue to be violated, will continue to be the target of this metaphysical holocaust. And I do hope that um, we begin to see the philosophical importance of the black penis as something much more 
uh, than a sexual organ of, of orgasmic uh, pleasure. Thank you. Uh, our second speaker uh, is Dr. Tiasan Johnson. Uh, he will be delivering his paper, Brothers Gonna Work It Out, assessing the implications of black masculinism and black male studies on institutional anti-black sand. Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for, for being here. And in particular, I want to thank Tommy Curry. If you didn't have a chance to see it, he was kind enough to come visit my campus a few weeks ago, and he gave two lectures in one day. So we made him work for every painting. <laughs> After a nine-hour flight or something like that, he, uh, he did quite a bit. And those are, are actually available uh, on YouTube, so you can see out of one of those. Um, so I know you guys have the pleasure of having him all the time, but we don't. So um, As you can see, um, I'm... Dealing with a concept, uh, I'm dealing with a concept that too is in progress. This is part of um, a book that I'm working on at the moment on black males. So this particular excerpt, uh, brother's going to work it out, comes out of a very particular conversation uh, that I've been having, particularly with Dr. Curry, um, on how we can begin to kind of frame out the infrastructure of what black male studies may look like. Um, now, for those of you that do remember the time period, the title comes out in a very particular context out of the hip hop group uh, uh, named Public Enemy. And I noticed that I, the older I get, I have to say these things because um, as much as I assume that everybody knows, my students are letting me know that I'm old. You know, the, last, one of the last classes I had, they asked me this, well, what, is it, what was it like during the Civil Rights Movement? To, uh, I'm 42. <laughs> I wasn't even born yet. So I have to put things in the context, right? Uh, Public Enemy, a uh, controversial hip hop group uh, starting in the late 1980s. Um, their second album, I believe it was, was the, if not third. Did it so? Second or third? There we go. Third. <laughs> I didn't even know. Um, Fear of a Black Planet, completely. Uh, course changes the scheme for not only hip hop for definitely but for conversations on black masculinity at the, at the time as well and so the title actually refers to a song that they did a video for and the video was actually uh, dealing with a series of um, uh, uh, some call them riots uh, some call them uh, uprisings that took place in Virginia Beach in 1990 where over 150 people were arrested stores were looted but it had to do with uh, blacks going down to Virginia Beach to celebrate and uh, enjoy the beach, and of course the town should be taking a very different attitude to it. The song itself opens up focusing on the need for black men to get active and become a part of their own um, liberation, so to speak. Now I align that with this event because Tommy Curry lays out a call, a call to action in many respects by uh, inviting people to participate in this discourse on black male studies. And so in doing so, um, the need for black men in particular uh, to be engaged in this discourse is incredibly important. So it, that's the title. Now, this is a letter. I don't know if some of you may have seen it. It was posted on Twitter, I want to say, about last week. This was a teacher in Atlanta who received this from, I believe, his fourth grade student. Um, and what it had to do with, in particular, was a uh, teacher being thanked. And I know for all the professors in the room, we're used to being thanked all the time. Right? Anyway, um, this particular student went so far as to not only let the teacher know how much he appreciated him, but uh, the extent to which he not only sees him like a father, but in many respects uh, as a father, considering that he never met his real father. And so I start with this because I think it becomes important, especially considering the majority of African Americans that I've met in my lifetime had various types of complications when it came to male members of their family on one level or another. And I think that becomes incredibly important in terms of this dialogue on black male studies because in any other context, that's such a lack or such an absence would be considered an epidemic of sorts in need of intense study. But that's not necessarily what we get 
with black males. We don't get intense study necessarily. We don't get uh, a sense of urgency uh, in, in regard to examination. Much of what we get is mythology. Mythology that for black men is individualized and not studied, especially in regard to anything institutional. The two foremost myths here um, that uh, permeate African American culture as imposed from outside of it, particularly after slavery, many of the myths that we're familiar with come about after slavery as a means of uh, social engineering as a means of shaping people's thoughts about black folk in general. Um, but in that, there are two that I think are most salient in regard to how black males are regarded to this day, the brute and the mandingo. Right? Um, the mandingo figure is the hypersexualized beast, um, usually with an accompanying beastly genitalia. Right? This in many ways becomes the basis for stereotypes about black men not only uh, having uh, almost inhuman uh, phalluses, but also being phallic in nature. Um, that, so the Mandingo stereotype kind of serves for that, especially in regard to the sexual role of black men were oftentimes forced to play on plantations, often against their will. And I accompany that with the brute. And the brute character we really see formalizing in Birth of a Nation, 1915, um, extending out of Thomas Dixon's text, The Klansman. Uh, and from that, these two characters begin to frame overarchingly black masculinity as both hostile um, and uh, hyper-masculine. And these stereotypes, in many ways, still frame how black men are described. They still frame the lack uh, of presence in many contexts, and they frame, in many respects, the situations black men find themselves. Uh, and these continue to evolve. As a matter of fact, the image on the left is the image of a brute figure post-World War II. All right, so we can see the brute figure extending off the plantation in the late part of the 19th century, early 20th, uh, but it's after the Great Migration that we see the, the brute character reimagined uh, in suits going in and out of speakeasies and engaging in violent and non-rational uh, acts, uh, his basic being being that of a savage. So these concepts grow and are re-articulated almost generationally. And the generation I came up in, particularly in the 80s and 90s, was one where it was through hip hop that we saw the reimagining of the brute um, as a contemporary brute, um, particularly through groups like uh, NWA and uh, even Public Enemy. But nonetheless, these are the two most salient stereotypes that in many ways shape our understanding of black men. And it is, even at conferences, acceptable for audiences and, of course, presenters with doctorate degrees to talk about black men no, to, to no greater extent outside of stereotype and be taken seriously. I just attended the National Council for Black Studies conference about a month and a half ago, and there were only uh, about five sessions on black males. And at least two of those sessions, the, the uh, presenting uh, committee uh, talked about black men solely from the vantage point of their own familial experiences. Right? And this was passed as acceptable dialogue on black men. And the, and the first presentation I saw was actually a question on whether or not black males wanted to go to college at all. So it was an interesting dichotomy to hear that being the question posed. No empirical data, no, no references, no citations, and yet uh, conversations about my friend's son and my, my, my girlfriend's son constituted a, 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 a a dialogue about black men in college. So stereotypes in many ways are acceptable. And part of what I see with Dr. Curry's call for black male studies, a field that I'm framing as um, one that confronts deeply entrenched stereotypes of black males using empirical and historical data, as well as, as, well as new, newly developed theory based on that data, uh, is one that I think opens up opportunities for critical dialogue as well as an opportunity to really look at what are the conditions that shape the reality and how are those conditions epigenetically created and recreated every generation. So with Black Male Studies, there's an opportunity to move past um, stereotype and engage uh, conditions that people are actually experiencing and living in. And one way to do that in regard to having a new space to create theory um, is, I think, um, through a method that 
I developed a method of approach, method of analysis that I termed black masculinism. Uh, and from that, what I use it for is I suggest that it allows for us to crit critically examine definitions, practices, and representations of black masculinities, highlighting progressive alternatives for practical consideration, but most importantly, articulating the black male experience of oppression as race, gender, and class. And I say it that way very purposefully, because interestingly enough, uh, particularly at Fresno State, when I actually approached the, the uh, campus about creating a class on black males that could be uh, linked to uh, the Women and Gender Studies Department on our campus, the argument I was given by a senior administrator was that they had no gender, which was interesting to hear right, from a senior administrator that black males didn't have a gender in regard to something studied in gender studies. Um, so the, the development of the concept of black masculinism for me comes out of that framework. And I, I actually envision it as an accompaniment to womanism in that its focus is ultimately the black family, uh, but at the end of the day being able to use frameworks that extend out of uh, measurable uh, frameworks, measurable structures that we can use. And so one such example, I actually had an activity um, that I was going to do, but it, it might take a little too long, so I am going to skip it. Um, but I'll use another just as an example of some theoretical arguments that can actually extend from using black men as the unit of analysis and yet entrenching that unit of analysis in their race, gender, and class experience. And this is one way I approach that. Uh, this actually extends out of chapter one out of my upcoming book. And what I do here is I look at several different contexts um, that allow us to, to articulate black masculinity at different time periods based on the political and social conditions of the times and how those particular conditions and issues shape the performance of black masculinity from one era to the next. And what kinds of conversations we can have if we engage black masculinity not as a permanent myth um, that, that, that retains the concept of the savage perennially, but as a, a changing uh, practice that allows people to articulate themselves at different time periods under different conditions and different ways. So this is you know, just one kind of example of a myriad of ways that we can actually begin to take seriously what black men experience and then re-question how that frames um, what we study and how we articulate that study. Um, one of the inspirations that I was able to kind of get under Dr. Curry was the development of what he's termed anti-black misandry. Sometimes I reframe it as a misandroir. But at the end of the day, I regard it as a form of racial sexism that refers to the hatred of black males based on both their gender and their race. Um, and this is actually, in and of itself, that one sentence has caused a great deal of frustration, particularly at a number of conferences I attended, where the very term sexism became the point of contestation. Can we talk about sexism as something that black men experience? That, in and of itself, has led to hours of contentious debate um, in and of itself. But nonetheless, the argument here is not only do we uh, experience this anti-black misandry, but I've actually framed about um, eight sub-areas where misandry can be looked at and examined under the umbrella of this concept of anti-black misandry as a whole. Right? So we're going to briefly look at those eight, and then we'll look at some of the context or rationales that, that, that allow us to kind of see that. So the first one that I look at underneath that, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to give you a brief example or two of what I mean by uh, Mazandroir. This is a very short video, but it'll give you a chance to look at what I'm talking about in regard, in regard to anti-black misandry, uh, and then we can uh, go back and look at it. So let's see if my computer is cooperating today. Today we're going to figure out the difference between how people react when he tries to break into it. I'm not sure why sound. Can everybody hear that okay? Yeah, yeah. Car versus when I try to break into a car. Let's find out. Oh, 
of that. This is a particular lynching that took place in Duluth. And it was basically um, two white teens that were attending a circus. Um, uh, it was a couple. And uh, they argued that the male was beat up and the female was raped. And out of that, they gathered about six workers out of the uh, circus group, took them to jail. And even though her doctor examined her and they found no evidence uh, of sex or rape uh, that took place, a town mob formed and pulled six, uh, several black men out of prison, four in particular, um, or three in particular, excuse me, uh, Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee, and they were beat up and hanged. Right? But again, at the accusation of rape. So this would serve you know, as a specific example. And it isn't alone, because it, it's, it goes along with uh, the scope of police brutality. Right? So roughly what we're still dealing with, and these are contemporary numbers, we're dealing with about 200 to 300 black males per year that are killed uh, by both police and vigilante action, as well as about black women. So these are, this, these are ongoing practices that I argue are still examples of misandry, right? anti-black misandry. <clears throat> Another area of anti-black misandry that I look at is what I call masculine transphobia. And this is basically a hatred of black trans women. Those who are considered males, um, those once considered black males based on the idea that black males are perennially violent rapists. So even after going through uh, a, a, even a complete sex change operation, there's still a vehement hatred, I find, of black trans women. And so in that regard, I, I just give two brief uh, examples. One is, uh, one is a little more general, the other a bit more specific. So in the last, I think it was in March, March 10th, uh, we found Nigerian feminist uh, Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie uh, making some comments about trans women, articulating the differences of their experiences uh, and the extent to which she didn't regard them as women. Uh, but it was interesting to note as she was talking about this in regard to transgendered folk, um, she didn't really make those comments about trans men. And I found it interesting that trans women became the target. And I really, as I began to kind of reflect on it, uh, in conversation with a number of other uh, uh, scholars I was talking to, we actually started talking about transgender access laws. And it was interesting when we began to cite and look at the examples people gave when they opposed questions about transgender access laws, the majority of those examples were trans women and the extent to which they provided a sexual threat, right, particularly to women in bathrooms. And so you can see the time.com quote, uh, but that quote is representative of a series of quotes that we found that were along the same lines. So, when, so even though the laws themselves, the, the, the nature of the language is gender neutral, when you actually began to look at the language people use and their opposition to it, overwhelmingly they were concerned with transgender women. Right? So uh, underneath that, there's still a question about the black masculine influence. Um, Anti-black male disposability as another form of misandry. This particular image comes out of uh, Nigeria. This was just before uh, what we, many of us were talking about uh, not long ago, about 300 Nigerian girls that were kidnapped. And just about a month and a half prior to that, there were about 57 uh, boys that were killed outright. And what was interesting is that there was no international discussion about them, not even in connection to the 300 girls that were kidnapped. Because you just as easily could have said both. I mean, in a particular article that I wrote, one of the things I connected in the hashtag was even, you know, bring, remember bring back our girls was the hashtag, bring back our girls and stop killing our boys. Could have just as easily been it. But at the end of the day, that erasure was considered normal. It was considered acceptable for some reason. So in that regard, I look at, to look at it as their deaths were uh, disposable. They were, they were easily avoided and ignored, and that was considered acceptable. Appropriation, right? What I deal with here is when groups appropriate black male life issues and experiences when convenient for their various agendas, but bait and switch them later for others other agendas once an adequate amount of uh, attention has been achieved. And we can see this in a lot of contexts. We can see it in fiction. Those of you, I'm sure most of you have probably seen the film Get Out, 
where they deal with appropriation in a very unique kind of way. <laughs> if I can use that term for that. Uh, we can see it in popular media on the left. And you can, you know, we can examine the ways uh, in pop culture, uh, black experiences, black aesthetic productions are appropriated. And we can even see it in the extent that we look at organizations like Black Lives Matter that in many ways uh, have appropriated narratives specific to black males but articulated issues uh, once the conversation gets started uh, that are focused on um, uh, black women, feminism, LGBT politics, and all of that is acceptable, but there is a question about the ways in which the conversations are starting, especially considering when you go to the Black Lives Matter website, black males are not mentioned. So there's a degree to which uh, these issues can be appropriated. Another I deal with is homoeroticism, and this one is in particular uh, inspired by Dr. Curry's, uh, Dr. Curry's work on the man not um, dealing with the literal and figurative consumption of the black male body, the eating of the black male, sustained by homoerotic sexual urge um, of racism, of the homoerotic sexual urge of racism. And I think um, my colleague, Dr. Warren, outlined that uh, well, although he used uh, his own terminology, I think it points, <coughs> points to the same issues the extent to which violence in and of itself can serve as a vehicle for homoerotic um, motivations in regard to conquering black men. And I use the image at the top purposefully, obviously, because I think in many respects that homoeroticism is also rooted in a hunting aesthetic where black men become big game. Okay. This one I call uh, anti-black male fetishistic homophilia. Uh, it also includes transphilia. And basically what it represents is that uh, black boys and men in media um, and either are, are usually either represented as a, in an exaggerated, stereotypically flamboyant, code for gay, fashion, or as masculine women. And it's interesting to find out and to look at how consistently we see that take place with black males in popular media, right? representing them as feminine and then going from there. And I think what that begins to do is it, in particular, to black gay men, marks them as separate from black heterosexual men in the popular imagination, uh, marks them as being less manly, despite that they're subject to the same costs, the same threats that black men in general are uh, experiencing in society, and mark them as comedic and entertaining. In other words, the form of dehumanization in many ways that uh, marks them as non-men, and that's whether the, that's despite whether the, the actors themselves are hetero and are presented as women or they're presented as flamboyant gay men, either way, there's a kind of fetishistic homophilia to it that, de that dehumanizes uh, black men, emasculates them, and, and translates them in contexts that are somewhat alien to their own articulations in the larger society. And uh, this one here being uh, anti-black male sexual objectification. So here I focus on two things, the ways in which black males can be sexually objectified. And I can tell you at a conference, just bringing up this concept alone led to two hours of argument as to whether or not black men could experience sexual objectification. Um, I break it down into two particular ways. I, I look at it both in terms of how we see the general idea that uh, in many ways black males can serve as just a vehicle for others' sexual gratification. Uh, they are assumed to always want sex, and by the way, that in many ways can provide a rationale for the rape and sexual violation, particularly of boys, young black boys, idea being that they are never victims and therefore are always wanting what they may experience, and that's if they're raped by uh, older men or women. And then, of course, number two, I talk about it both as a, a different type of sexual objectification in that uh, black men can be seen as subject, uh, success objects. Um, in other words, they can be uh, sought after for both financial support as well as uh, the kind of stereotypically gendered tasks that men are regarded as doing, um, such as repairing, paying for you know, various types of repairs, protection from violence, things of that nature. Um, and these are stereotypical in, in that you know there's a, a constant expectation, particularly in men of men in general, but I think this also applies to black men uh, that they be able to repair, fix, and protect the family. 
um, which sometimes can be laughable, because if you wait for me to fix your car, it will <laughs> never be fixed. Right? I know nothing about it, but I'm always tripped out on how many people will expect me to know it and, and provide that service in a particular context. So I say basically here, in essence, black men are sexually objectified in regard to their penises, penis size, length, sexual prowess, class, career status, marriage ability, financial resources, virility, and assertiveness, read as manly. So different types of sexual objectification. And then the last of um, the sub-areas of misandry I look at is failure slash incompetence. Failure slash incompetence. Now the pictures you see there, um, I usually, in my classes, I show a quick video. Uh, those are both from the, the sitcom Martin. Um, but you can find it particularly, not only in popular culture, you can find it in daily interactions, but the expectation of failure, which is also tied to um, assumptions of low intelligence, these are things that have been tied to black men since slavery. Uh, the ideas of being ineffective, incompetent, and really being, as Tommy terms it, um, men not. I wanted to rush through a few of those because I did want to at least present some of the data that we get to look at that extends, in my argument, out of this black mass and black male studies uh, project. Right? Um, and this is mostly data that I've come across in the last six or so years, five or six years, uh, particularly after meeting Dr. Curry. And it amazed me how, no matter how many, I think I've, I've taken gender classes since undergrad. That's, 19 below or what? <laughs> um, so at least over 20, I'll say over 20 years, I'll leave it at that. Um, and the extent to which in none of those classes was I ever presented with any of the data we're going to look at. And it's easily accessible, but I never knew what it was. So the first one dealing with suicide and life expectancy. Right? So, you know, just straightforward looking at black males finding them at the lowest end of the life expectancy rate. And in regard to suicide, um, looking at the extent to which suicide is an overwhelmingly male occupation in general, but for African Americans, it's particularly high. Mm. Right. So in 2007, 82% uh, of African American suicides were male, 83% um, from 15 to 24, 10% for African American females. So just the dynamics alone. I was amazed that it had never come up in casual dialogues in, in any of the gender courses I had taken. Maybe that's different for some of you, uh, particularly here, but I find that it hasn't been made common knowledge. Um, this is actually a conversation I have with my students about uh, disposability, and we talk about the extent to which uh, disposability actually starts in childhood, particularly for boys, uh, whether it's the toys, um, video games or sports, the extent to which there's a preparation, so to speak, for disposability. That, you know, boys in particular learn that sacrifice is the beginning of their contribution or is the totality of their contribution to a given society. The individual is less valuable than the group, so on and so forth. And that in and of itself is not necessarily bad, but it's not a difficult leap for us to see where those kinds of uh, social trainings take us to in terms of uh, jobs. And so um, in this context, many of the kinds of occupations that you're seeing here are, in many instances, 99% male. Um, and as they relate to men, sacrifice and disposability become features of those kinds of jobs. And I do put gangs here as a job, especially since uh, the early 1980s, late 1970s, in many parts of uh, the urban center for blacks, uh, the only jobs available to many of them, um, once uh, blue collar jobs were taken overseas, were whenever they could develop. And as drugs were pumped into those communities, you actually had occupations that developed in response. And I, I chart gangs as, as part of that dynamic. Um, this one looks at cancer rates. So, um, this one goes to 2011. I recently looked at the 2014 charts. They really don't change very much. This has to do with rates of death in regard to cancer. The chart on the left is male. The chart on the right is female. And the red lines are for uh, black folk, African Americans. So in that regard, 
Um, there are particular instances where the African American cancer death rate is almost twice that of the African American female death rate. And the only reason I compare black women and men in that regard is to highlight the extent to which black males have a unique experience that most, most of the time is dismissed as a racial experience. But if it differs, especially in a significant manner from women, there needs to be a different kind of conversation. So I know I'm rushing through these, but I wanted to at least um, end with some information that you can take with you. Male rape statistics. Now I have I have this in a form that I can send to you if you're interested. So obviously we won't have enough time to go through this in depth. But essentially, um, what this particular slide allows us to look at is, the, is, is what males in general, but particularly black males, experience in regard to rape. Right. So there's been a change in laws. Um, very recently, the FBI defined rape uh, as something very different early on, all the way up to, I think it was 2012. And in that regard, um, it was defined really in terms of uh, violating uh, women's bodies. But as the, the, the definition began to change, and it was opened up to include penetration of all sorts with a foreign object, with a uh, finger, with a genitalia, so on and so forth, they began to find that there were extensive numbers of males that came forward. Right. And so the rates are actually very close to similar across the board. And so the CDC actually is quoted as saying women rape as often as men. And yet still, that's not necessarily part of the dialogue that we have when we talk about um, rape. Uh, there were other statistics, particularly by Richard Felson and Patrick Cundiff, Cundiff that talked about 15-year-old males um, being just as likely to be raped as 40-year-old uh, women, or more likely so. So when you actually add up some of the newer dynamics, the made to penetrate cases, the newer definition of rape by the FBI, and prison, and this is one of the most significant dynamics in regard to rape. Uh, roughly speaking, over the last number of years, you've had about 200,000 women incarcerated, about 65,000 of that black women, and about 2.2 million men incarcerated, about 750,000 or so black men. So in that dynamic, it's interesting to note that rate, the rates of rape have actually been higher at women's prisons than men's. But because of the raw number of men incarcerated, the number of rape incidents that take place are much higher among men. So when you factor that with the made to penetrate cases, the new definition of rape by the FBI that uh, steps back from locating it just as a woman's issue, we find that the rates of rape are exceptionally high. And because black men are statistically incarcerated at greater rates than any other demographic, so too are the rates of rape that black men experience. show one other slide. And this one charts homelessness. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration put out a document that identified that men constitute about 90% of homeless, and yet out of that, particularly in the 1999 study, 40% of those were black men. So in places like New York, 92.9% .9 were black, 82.3% were male, on Philadelphia, 92.9 were black, 71.1 were male. Some of these men were sexually abused and, and literally had no shelters to go to, while others uh, used prisons as shelter, shelters. So in and of that, uh, looking at homelessness, uh, which is also connected to uh, wealth, we can talk about wealth and employment at another point, um, these are uh, situations that are not only overwhelmingly male, but in certain urban cities, overwhelmingly black male. Okay, so I'll stop right here. Thank you.